Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to your service. It's lovely to have you with us. And if you're watching online, uh, we welcome you warmly. Uh, it's wonderful to come together uh, on a Lord's Day evening uh, to worship and to come together in prayer and praise and to study God's Word. So hope we've had a, I hope you've all had a lovely afternoon and it's wonderful to welcome you to your service tonight. A call to worship this evening is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 uh, to 22. I'm going to read these verses as we prepare our hearts to worship God. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Our opening item of praise this evening is the Scottish Psalter version of Psalm 100. We're going to sing these wonderful words. Uh, All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. As usual, the psalm will be played out through the speakers, but we invite you to sing along uh, behind your masks as we praise God together. Let's stand. That was wonderful. It's so nice. I think that everyone is closer together. It feels like, like the voices are coming together more, which is wonderful. Let's, let's pray as we praise together. Father, we give you our praise and thanks, and we want to join um, the multitude of voices across the nations praising you uh, on this Lord's Day at the start of this new week. 
Um, we come to you this evening to sing to you with cheerful voice, uh, to acknowledge that you alone are God, and to rejoice that we are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you so, so much for everything you've done for us, and thank you that we can come together just now to worship you. And so as we come, we pray, O oh God, that you would um, still our hearts and help us to focus our minds. We pray that we would come to you um, in spirit and in truth, not simply in body outwardly, not just simply going through a, a, a routine of, of coming to a, a physical location and acting out something outwardly, but we pray that inwardly in our hearts, that in spirit we would be worshipping you. And we pray that we would worship you in truth, not, not half-heartedly and, and absolutely not hypocritically, but in truth, with integrity, coming to you as we are. And we just want to acknowledge, Father, that we need you so much. We all need you so much. For all of us, the past week will have had good things and would have had challenges. And for the week ahead, there's things we're looking forward to. There's things that we're worry, worrying about. We need you at every moment. And we want to live for you at every moment. And so please, may you guide us and direct us by your Spirit. And please make us the people you want us to be. But we also just acknowledge that not only do we need you, but we need each other. We need one another as brothers and sisters, we need, to, we need each other's friendship, each other's encouragement, guidance, company, laughter, help. And we pray that you would bind us closer together. We acknowledge and confess that often we are, we are afraid to let our guard down around other people. We, we don't want to show our weaknesses to others. And often we can be maybe too quick to judge others or too quick to feel defensive or feel judged by one another. We pray, O oh God, that you would bind us together with a spirit of love and gentleness and, and a commitment to bear with one another as you have commanded us to. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would bind us closer to you and bind us closer to one another, that we would live this week as those who love God and love our neighbor. So bless us now, we pray. Thank you for everyone here, for everyone watching online. We ask that as we worship together now, that your hand would be upon us, that your name would be praised. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our reading this evening is taken from Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, and we are going to read verses 1 to 16. Uh, I've got that on page 1143, but the words are on the screen, and you can follow them on, on your phone if you prefer, or um, if you have a Bible, it may be a different page number, as you know. So Romans chapter 15, this is just coming towards the end of this great letter, um, and where Paul comes and, uh, as he often does, gives some practical instructions uh, to the congregation there. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. 
In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is God's word, and we pray that he would bless it uh, to us. Before we turn to God's word, we're going to uh, pray together again. Um, it's always good to think about how we pray um, to God. Um, in many ways, um, prayer is a very personal thing, and we all have different patterns that we follow when we pray. Um, and, and I think that that's a really good thing um, that, that you know, we're all different in that regard. But, but it's also good to talk about it and to think about it that maybe you know, sometimes we can learn from Scripture and from others um, to help us grow in our prayer lives because prayer is such such an important part of our lives as Christians and as what we do. And I think I just want to take a moment to remind you of how wonderful and important the Lord's Prayer is. And the great thing about the Lord's Prayer is that we can pray that prayer as it is, um, but we can also use it as a guide and a template for our prayers. And we can do that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, as you pray, you can pray through the different elements of the Lord's Prayer, and we can do that in our services uh, um, when we're praying as well. And that's what I want to do this evening. I want to use the Lord's Prayer as a pattern to shape our prayer lives. And it's maybe a helpful thing. Sometimes in our Christian lives, we find ourselves thinking, well, I don't really know what to say in my prayers, or I feel a little bit, a little bit silent before God. Um, the Lord's Prayer can be such a wonderful guide and help at these times. So um, as we pray, let's, uh, let's remember that together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are our Father, and, and that as we come to you, we come to the one who cares for us with a love that, that, that is beyond what we can know and understand. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. We thank you that you are our loving Heavenly Father. And we pray that your name would be hallowed in our lives and across the world. We pray that, that we ourselves would recognize more and more that you are the holy God, and we pray that our lives would reflect that so that as we live out our lives, we would be holy as you are holy. Help us to see and understand how that can work its way out in our lives so that your name would be hallowed in everything that we do, whether it's in public when everyone's watching us or in secret when no one can see us except you. We pray that your kingdom would come and how we pray, Lord Jesus, that your kingdom would extend in our communities. We pray that you would draw more people to come to faith in you. And we pray that your rule would extend to every part of our lives as well. We, we never want to think that we just have certain parts of our lives that are, 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 are under your authority and other parts of our lives where we do what we like. We want every part of our lives and every moment of this week to be lived in obedience to you. You are king. We want to please you and obey you. So we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that your will would be done in our lives, that we would obey you and follow you and serve you in the days and weeks ahead. Help us to see, Father, when we, when we are, are turning away from, from what you want. Help us to follow you in obedience and with joy. We acknowledge, Father, that we're dependent on you every day, so we pray that you'd give us each day our daily bread, our food, our clothes, our energy for the tasks that we have. We need you so much. So for everyone, especially anyone who's feeling weak or worn out, anyone who's got a lot ahead of them this week, we pray, Father, that they would know your sustaining and your provision and your help. We pray that you'd forgive us for our sins. We acknowledge, Father, that we sin against you. And 
We come to you in repentance. We thank you that in Jesus we have a great high priest. But as we ask for your forgiveness, we also freely offer our forgiveness to any who have wronged us. And we acknowledge, Father, that we do not want to keep a record of wrong, but we, we want to forget about other people's sins and forgive others just as you have forgiven us. We pray that you lead us not into temptation. Help us to go past temptation. Help us not to turn to the left or to the right, but to follow you, to hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Please be our guide. And when we face temptation, please give us strength to resist and help us also to see sin for what it really is. So often we see temptation and it's attractive to us. Help us to see that it's actually horrible and help us with that knowledge to, to walk past temptation and to follow you. And please deliver us from evil, from the evil around us in the world, from the evil in our own hearts, and, and from the attacks of the evil one himself. We pray for your protection. We pray that we would wear the full armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the readiness in our feet that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. May we be uh, prepared, O oh God, by you to live for you in obedience and to your glory in the week ahead. And in everything we pray that your name would be honored and glorified, that you take our lives this week and use them for your glory. Help us to see that every one of us here can serve you and can be tools in your hands for the furthering of your kingdom. So we pray these things, Father, asking that you would answer us according to your wisdom and your will and that you'd have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for a short while this evening, I'd like us to go back to Romans chapter 15 and the passage that we read. Uh, we're going to focus especially on verse 14, where Paul says, I'm satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. And as we look at this verse, I want to ask what I think is an incredibly important question. I want us to ask, what does a successful church look like? I think that's a really important question um, because we want our church and, and uh, every other church around us, the Church of Scotland next door, the other churches on our island, we want them all to do well and to be successful. We don't want to see our churches failing. We don't want to be unsuccessful as the church of Jesus Christ. We all want that, but that raises the question, what does success look like in the church? And I don't know what comes into your mind, first of all, but there's lots of things that we can think of. I think the most obvious is we think of size. So big means successful, very often. Or we might think of activities. A successful church has lots of different stuff going on, and, and it's wonderful to see that. We might think of resources. Uh, often we can, we can find that, you know, some churches that are sort of failing or almost on the brink of closing are doing so because they lack resources. They don't have money. Their buildings are falling down, uh, and they're struggling. A successful church has loads of resources. It's wealthy. It's got lots of staff, it can support various ministries, and they've got a good building, uh, and it's all well set up. But we might think of a good organization. A successful church is one that functions well and that runs really well. And all of those things are important, and I'm definitely not denying that these things matter. But are these the things that are most important? Are these the defining characteristics of a successful church? Well, I think the verse that's before us in Romans 15 is very important because here Paul tells us what he considers to be the hallmarks of a successful church. And 
that immediately makes this a very important verse for us to consider. And it's interesting that at the start of the verse, he says that he's satisfied about uh, his brothers and sisters in Rome. And that word's a really interesting one. The word satisfied can also mean persuaded, and it conveys the idea that Paul is convinced about the condition of this congregation. He's satisfied. To them, their success and then he gives three statements which reveal what that success looks like. And in a moment ago, we said that success, thinks, we think about size and resources and wealth and all that kind of stuff. There is none of that in verse 14. Paul says he's satisfied for different reasons. It's because they're full of goodness, they're filled with all knowledge, and they're able to instruct one another. And this is one of the moments where we kind of wish we could say to Paul, why did you pick those things? Is that really what a successful church looks like? Are these the things that we should be aiming for? Well, that's what I want us to think about for a wee while together tonight. So first of all, a successful church is full of goodness. Now, that's the kind of phrase that I think can sometimes bounce off us. It's so obvious, it's almost not worth saying, and at the same time, it's so optimistic, it can th you can think, well, it's not even much point expecting that. So, theoretically, we endorse it. In reality, we don't necessarily expect it. So, imagine I was sent to a big conference um, in America. There's often massive church conferences in America. People from all over the world go to them. And imagine I was standing up there in a lecture. Not that that'll ever happen. I'll never get invited to one of these things. But supposing it did, imagine I was standing up there and someone put his hand up and an American says, what's your strategy? What's your vision for your church? If I said, well, my vision is to be full of goodness, I think, I think it would sound really silly. People would think, that sounds very naive or maybe even deluded. It's so easy to read a phrase like that and to not take it seriously, and yet that would be a huge mistake. There is nothing in the Bible that we should not be taking seriously. And so when Paul identifies being full of goodness as a strategic target for the church, he's not being naive, he's not being optimistic, and he's not being deluded. He's saying, that is your objective. If we want to be successful, then we want to be a church that is full of goodness. Now, let's just unpack that phrase a little bit more. The word goodness refers to moral excellence, an uprightness of heart, whereby we're characterized by good and not by evil. And that then shows itself outwardly in kindness, generosity, sharing, and in acting for the benefit of others. And then you've got the word fool, which is actually a slightly rare word here. What it really means is to be very full, to fill a space beyond expectations, or to be constantly preoccupied with something. In other words, Paul is saying a successful church is obsessed with goodness, and its goal is to be bursting with goodness. That means that we want every part of our church life to be full of goodness, so that wherever you look, whether it's the Kirk Session or the Deacon's Court or the Creche or the Sunday School or the WFM or whatever activity we're involved in, we should be looking at these things and see that they're characterized by a moral excellence and an overflowing kindness. These things are to be full of goodness. That's the hallmark of a successful church. Goodness should saturate every part of church life. And so whatever you're involved in in the church or whatever you might sign up to get involved in, your job is to bring a saturation of goodness to that role. And this is where a phrase like this is so encouraging to every one of us, because no matter what your gifts or personality may be, you can bring goodness to your role in the life of the church. So you might be quiet and shy, 
but you can still be full of goodness. You might be bubbly and enthusiastic. You can still be full of goodness. You might be super organized and efficient. You can still be full of goodness. You might be quite happy to blend into the background and quietly work away where no one sees you and still be full of goodness. And of course, all of this is reminding us that God's goal for life is that it would be full of goodness. And so when we say that we want to be a church full of goodness, we don't just mean on a Sunday. We mean every single part of lives, our lives. Our whole life is to be full of goodness because that's what God wanted for humanity from the very beginning. And one of the greatest tools that the devil has used to lure humanity away from God is to try to persuade us that God doesn't really want what's good for you. So many people think that. They think that God is not going to make life better. He's going to make it worse. That he's the great spoiler that's going to kind of muck everything up. That has got to be one of the greatest blasphemies that the world has ever known. God himself is so good and when he created human life, he created it to be so good. Now, we know that that's been broken and spoiled by sin, a sin which resulted from the devil's lie to Eve that God wasn't really being good to her. And the old humanity, instead of enjoying God's goodness and everything that he intended for us, that old humanity has now been infected with badness. And you can see the evidence everywhere. But the great message of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, a work of restoration has begun. And a new humanity is being raised up out of the old. And God's great goal is that life would be full of goodness again. And the consummation of that will be in the future, in the new creation. But today, there's a place where the blessings of the age to come are seen now. And that place is the church of Jesus Christ. And so it all makes perfect sense. God wants goodness. He's promising goodness. And our lives as a church is to be a beacon of goodness to the world around us. And of course, that is why badness in a church is so damaging and so wrong. Bitterness Deceit, envy, strife, division, slander, malice, selfishness, gossip, criticism, all the things that Paul lists again and again in his, in his epistles, all of these things are a pollution in the church of Jesus Christ. And what we have to all recognize is that just as we can be a source of goodness, so too we can be a source of that pollution and so I read a verse like that, and I find myself very often, I'll read that, and I'll blast through it, that you yourselves are full of goodness, and I'll just move on, and I'll not think about it. But when I stop and think about it, and then I look at myself, and I ask, am I full of goodness in everything I say? And so often I'm not. And yet that's exactly what God's Word is telling me to be. And so that's why I think by God's grace, I want that to be my goal and that to be at the heart of my objective and strategy. And it makes perfect sense in terms of our witness to the world around us because no one wants badness. So yes, all around us in the community or at work or even in your families, there's people who live their lives without much thought of God or without much interest in church. But these people are still made in the image of God and they still know that goodness is better than badness. No one wants bad neighbors or bad friends or a bad husband or bad colleagues or a bad boss or bad parents. No one wants badness. And that is why a church full of goodness everything that Scotland in 2021 needs. And that's why Paul says, make that your objective. Second thing he says is that a successful church is filled with all knowledge. Now, very often in our Christian lives uh, and in our preaching, 
the focus is on the heart, and that's a great thing. Um, and so, when we talk about goodness, whether it's in speech or actions, fundamentally that's an issue of the heart. And the Christian message is a message to your heart, a message of love, healing, peace, and joy. The heart is so important, and a hard heart is deadly. But the fact that the Bible speaks so much to our hearts does not for one second mean that the Bible is not also speaking to your mind. That's why Paul is reminding us that if we are to be a successful church, then we must aim to be filled with knowledge. We said a moment ago that one of the great lies of the devil throughout all of humanity is, is the lie that God doesn't actually want to be good to us. Another of the great lies that the devil has spread about Christianity is that it's mindless. And that's what leads many people to, to doubt Christianity or even to oppose it because they think it's mindless. And it's, it's perhaps the case that, that, that even Christians have reinforced that because sometimes, you know, we've, we've behaved as though the mind is not that important, that, you know, we just believe and we just go on and we don't tend to think too much about it. And knowledge has, has often been replaced with feelings or experience in terms of what matters in the Christian church, especially in recent times. The key point that Paul and the whole of Scripture constantly reminds us of is that mindless Christianity is not biblical Christianity. Again and again and again, the Bible seeks to engage our minds. Again and again, we are challenged to think. That's that's what lies at the heart of being a disciple of Jesus. The word disciple means a learner. Learning means growing in knowledge. God wants us to think. He wants us to understand. And that's why there's a little word in verse 14 that's so important. Paul speaks about all knowledge. And that we word all is so important because I think it's telling us that Paul's not just saying, I want you to be full of Bible knowledge. He's saying, I want you to grow in every area of knowledge. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be experts in everything. That's impossible. But I think it does mean that Paul is reminding us that every area of our knowledge about the universe around us is utterly bound up with our knowledge of God. In other words, our worldview must be shaped by what the Bible teaches. Now, a biblical worldview is such a crucial aspect of being a follower of Jesus. It means that you don't just have Christianity as this wee box in the corner of your life, and then you just, you just have a kind of a rest of your understanding of life that doesn't bring Jesus into it. A biblical worldview means that whatever you're looking at, politics, science, morals, philosophy, society, whatever it may be, all of it is shaped by the truths that God reveals to us in Scripture. 500 years ago, a very famous book was written by John, John Calvin. It's called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's a big, thick book, but I would say don't be scared of it. It's actually not too hard a book to read. It's divided up into lots of little sections, so it's the kind of book you can just dip into and read a little bit of. You can actually get it online for free um, if you don't want to have to pay for it. It's a wonderful book, and at the beginning, Calvin begins with a vital point. He says that the only way we will have knowledge of ourselves as humans is if, first of all, we have knowledge of God. There's the quote there, man never attains to a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down from after such contemplation to look into himself. It's reminding us that we, we need a worldview, a, a, a grasp of all knowledge that has the God of the Bible at the center of it. And our claim as Christians is that the only worldview that ultimately makes sense is the biblical worldview. Now, that's a big claim, but it is entirely logical. 
Because if God is the creator of the universe, then we are never going to understand it if we make no reference to him. But if our knowledge of the world is shaped by the Bible, then it's going to enable us to properly understand the world around us. It's easy to think that, that, that Christianity is just like a kind of like a walking stick or a crutch to help you through life, or that it's about doing something nice on a Sunday, or that it's about being a better person. In many ways, that's what kind of Christianity in inverted commas has become in the West today. And yet that's a tragic diminishing of what the Bible is saying. The message of the Bible is so much bigger than that. The message of the Bible is that that the message of Jesus is the only place where you'll be able to make sense of the universe. God wants you to have true, reliable, logical knowledge. Now, you might be saying, well, Thomas, that's all very big claims that you're making. I'm standing here, I'm saying the only way you're going to understand the universe properly is with a biblical worldview. That is 100% what I'm saying. I think we can test it. So here are some statements that I think we can con confidently say almost everybody in Scotland will agree with and anybody who disagrees with them would be seen as very much on the fringes of society uh, and of acceptable um, understanding. So family is special, cancer is bad, life is precious, injustice is wrong, joy is good, nature is beautiful, love is most important of all. And the test is this. How do you know any of that's true? I think you could stop anybody in the streets of Stornoway and ask them whether they agreed with those things, and they would say yes. But how do they or you know that any of that is true what is the world view that lies behind these statements? And this may be a wee bit of a simplification, but I think that that, that question, how do you know any of that's true? I think it tends to result in three different categories of response. Number one is distraction. Just don't think about it. And that's by far the most popular choice. We live in a world today that is just longing for one more distraction after another. And you can see examples of that everywhere, in social media, in activities, in box sets, in whatever. It's just, don't think about that kind of stuff. Find the next distraction. The other option is denial. So even though someone's worldview might be pushing them away from these conclusions, they then kind of deny that, that they're going to accept the conclusion of their own worldview. So a brilliant example of that is what we'd call atheistic naturalism, the kind of viewpoint today that the world is just a closed system, there's nothing supernatural, and everything is just part of this great machine that starts with nothing and ends with nothing and does a little bit of mechanical processes in between. And in that worldview, at best, love Beauty and people are just accidents. But hardly anyone takes that worldview to its logical conclusion. They deny their own worldview and they just hold on to some kind of value in these areas. So there's distraction, there's denial. The third option is despair. That's the least popular, op popular option, but it's the most rational and logical. And this is where people who have no thought of God in their lives, but who really think, so people who, who deny God, but who really think about life, this is where they usually find themselves. And you can read about that if you read some of the great existential philosophers, uh, or the atheist existential philosophers, at least in the, in the 20th century. You see it often in some of the, the, the most gifted musicians and artists. They think things through, and they realize that with no God, they've got nothing. 
And we've always got to ask ourselves, are you one of these? And this is where we see that knowledge is so important in the church, because knowledge gives us answers. And if anything is true of Scotland in 2021, all around us, people are looking for answers. Life is so cruel, so perplexing, so frustrating everywhere. People are looking for answers. And the Bible is giving us knowledge that provides us with answers. It explains beauty. So you can stand on the top of a Monroe in Scotland and see breathtaking beauty in front of you. The Bible explains why that is making you say, wow. Because as an image bearer of God, you can recognize and appreciate beauty. That's why the sheep don't stand at the top of the hill saying, wow. Only humans. The Bible explains why injustice is wrong. And so you think of people exploited in the world. The Bible explains that that is wrong. And that, that, that you know, to take the concept of survival of the fittest into social structures whereby you say the strongest man can take whatever woman he wants or the most powerful warlord can snatch whatever territory is like, the Bible explains why you know that that is wrong. And all of these things we've listed, the Bible fills us with knowledge. A biblical worldview gives an answer to all of these things. And this is where you see a successful church combines these two things. Goodness to the point of overflowing and knowledge. Often you think you sometimes have to choose between these two things. In a biblical worldview, you don't. You can have all the goodness that we love and rejoice in, and you can have the knowledge that satisfies the questions that you have in your mind. A successful church is full of goodness, filled with knowledge. That is a brilliant combination. But there's one more thing that Paul highlights, a final hallmark. A successful church is able to instruct one another. That word instruct is really interesting. It could also be translated advise. It could even be a translated warn. And sometimes that's what Paul does. Throughout this letter, he's giving them instructions, and at times he's had to be bold. He says that in verse 15, I've had, to be, I've had to speak very boldly towards you in times. But all of that correction and warning is in the context of God's grace and with the goal of helping these Christians in Rome grow in their faith. And so the key lesson for us as a church is that if we want to be successful then it's crucial that we are able to instruct and warn one another. And thinking about our first two points, that makes perfect sense. The whole concept of goodness implies right and wrong, doesn't it? So th some things are good and some things are bad. And the whole concept of knowledge implies a need to learn. That's why we need to instruct one another. Now, for many of us, this is something that we maybe don't really like to think about. It can be off-putting, especially today. It's so easy to think, I don't want to be instructed. I don't want to be told to do. And we tend to think that we should not be subject to other people's instruction, especially in terms of our behavior or our convictions. But if you think about it for a moment, for all the stuff in life that is really important, then we definitely want to be told what to do. So if you imagine that you were at an airport and there was a security alert, the last thing you would want is for everyone to say, I'm going to do my own thing. You would want clear instruction from the security staff. If you were hoping to secure the purchase of a house, you would need a solicitor to tell you exactly what to do. If you were with a child who had breathing difficulties and you dialed 999, you would do everything that the person on the phone was telling you 
to do. When we talk about the most important things in life, instruction is a brilliant thing. And for us as a church, the message of the Bible is about the things which by a mile are the most important things in life. That's why instruction and even warning is an incredibly important thing. And it's really important that we don't think that warning implies harshness. It's easy to think that. Some people can think that warning is some kind of punishment. It's not. Biblical warning does not imply harshness. It implies the deepest level of love. If you like someone, then sometimes you know you'll maybe tell them nice things that they want to hear. If you love someone, you'll tell them the difficult things that you know they need to hear. And for all of us, two important questions arise from that. We need to ask, are we ready to instruct one another? And in order to do that, we need to learn what the Bible says so that we have the knowledge that we need. That's why learning is so important. But we also need to know each other. And that's why being together on a Sunday and being together on a Thursday is so, so important. And as restrictions ease, please, please take the opportunity that we now have to be together, to spend time with one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus. We need to know each other if we're going to instruct one another. So we have to ask, are we ready to instruct? But we also have to ask, are we ready to be instructed? When you think about a warning, which one's easier, to give it or to get it? It's a lot easier to give it. It's harder to take it. But Paul is reminding us that if a successful church is one where we're going to instruct one another, that doesn't mean that we're just good at instructing. It also means that these Romans were good at listening and they were prepared to learn. Sometimes our pride can make us reluctant to listen, reluctant to ask for instruction. I've maybe told this before, I've used this illustration before. Um, I am often very silly in a supermarket for lots of reasons. I often buy stuff I don't need, especially if I'm hungry and going through the shop. But the other thing I do is that if I can't find something, I'm so reluctant to ask someone. I'm like, I want to find it myself. I don't want to ask. I want to find it myself. And that's just pride and stupidity combined together, resulting in a waste of time. If I just ask for instruction, I get the information I need. And for us as a church, that's a crucial thing to remember. It's vital that we're able to instruct one another. So what does a successful church look like? Big, rich, impressive? No. A successful church is full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. That's what we need to aim for. And that's why numbers aren't really very relevant. Resources don't really matter. And the measure of success does not lie in the number of activities that we have. But I'm sure that a church that's full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to instruct one another is the kind of church that will actually grow and the kind of church that people will want to be a part of. That's Paul's idea of a successful church. By God's grace, that's what we need to aim for. Let's go for it together. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as a church, both for ourselves here, but also in partnership with our brothers and sisters in the Church of Scotland next door, we pray that we would be full of goodness, that we would be full of all knowledge, and that we will be able to instruct one another. Amen.
Our closing item of praise is the Sing Psalms version of Psalm 40, no, the Psalter version of Psalm 40, apologies, uh, from verses 1 to verse 5. These wonderful words, I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. Please stand and we'll sing these verses together. I waited for the Lord my God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I mentioned in the morning, um, we no longer have to leave um, in, as uh, pew by pew as previously was the case, um, but if you do want to take your time leaving, then please please feel free to do so, but otherwise uh, you're able to, to leave the building as, uh, as in normal circumstances. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for being with us online. Uh, may you all know God's blessing and strength in the week ahead. Amen. <laughs>